All right, hello everyone. Thanks for joining us for today's Jenkins Masterclass webinar on demystifying debugging through logging. We have a fair amount to get through today, but I just wanna let you all know a few things up top. One, we are recording. So should you need to review this later on, or maybe you have a colleague who is unable to join, that will be able to happen later on. Uh, on top of that, you can ask questions as we go. Please do as soon as you think of one, even if maybe we'll answer it during the course of the session. We always wanna know what people wanna know about. So as soon as you think of one, go right ahead and put it into the question panel. At the, also, there's at the very, very end, when I close this out, a link to a very short survey will come up just asking what you thought and what you'd like to learn more about. In the meantime, I don't want to take up too much more of our time, so I'd like to pass this over to our first presenter, uh, Ryan Smith. Ryan. Hey, everybody, and thank you, Max, for putting this together. This is Ryan Smith. I'm the Global Escalation Manager for CloudBees. If you don't know about CloudBees, we're the number one contributor to the Jenkins project. We've got the home of a large group of Jenkins certified engineers, and we are the home of Jenkins. And uh, I've been in the industry for about 10 years. I've been with CloudBees for about two. And I'm also presenting today with my colleague and friend, Alex Taylor. Alex, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Hey, guys. I'm, I'm also a... Uh... Uh, staff development support engineer here at CloudBees. Um, I've been here for about four years now uh, working on Jenkins since then. I do a couple of back-end fixes um, for plugins and, and just generally teach around the support organization um, to try and help uh, grow our knowledge inside of the, the support organization. Awesome. Thanks, Alex. Alex failed to mention he is also an international man of mystery. Um, while we're here today, we're going to talk about some really cool stuff in the next 45 minutes. Um, for the most part, we're going to be talking about best practices around Jenkins logging. We're going to walk you through exactly how Jenkins logging works. We're going to dive into the meat and potatoes of how to analyze stack traces and, um, and really talk about the inner workings of, of what's being presented to you as far as that stack trace goes from a Java perspective. I'm also going to um, show you some real world data use cases that Alex is going to present uh, today. And we're, we're going to show you some really powerful tools that are free for you to use, uh, provided to you from CloudBees. And I'm also going to give you an overview of our support offering at the very end of this, pro, uh, this webinar, as well as um, some, some new tools that we think you're really going to like. If you're joining us today, I'm really hoping that you're a Jenkins administrator already or you've got, some, uh, you've got some background with Jenkins, some of the, the stuff is, is going to be beginner to fairly medium intermediate level today. Um, but at the end of the day, I hope that you learned something from this and let's, let's kick it off. So the first area of our presentation is going to be where to start with log diagnosis. So maybe you're a new admin and have been asked to make Jenkins run smoothly. Maybe you're an old soul at keeping the lights on in the server room. Either way, the first time you're presented with a big whopping error like this staring at you, it can be like looking at the matrix and it can be intimidating. The goal in this presentation is I wanna empower you as a Jenkins administrator to understand what an error like this means. And that means less time chasing down your engineering team for help, less time spent diagnosing Jenkins issues, and more time spent doing what we all love doing, which is building stuff that matters. So first things first, we need to understand where to go and look for logs. There are default log locations for Jenkins, as you see here. And these locations are dependent on which operating system you run. If you're running a CloudBees Jenkins distribution, then you already have the support core plugin, which we'll get into later. And that's installed by default, which adds additional logging configurations to the file system. There's some additional JVM centric logging that we recommend be turned on as part of our best practices. And there you're going to find definable JVM level garbage collection logs, as well as JVM error logs. And you can even set paths for heap dumps if your application happens to crash. Mm -hmm. To dive right in, Jenkins is an enterprise Java application. And like most Java applications, it uses the Java util logging to report on all the actions taking place within the app. By default, all logging that comes out is at an info level or above and is sent to the standard out. However, it's important that I mention that most servlet containers alter this behavior, depending on their default settings. 
And they also tend to bundle all the JVM logs into a single output, and it can make debugging difficult. Luckily, Jenkins is equipped with a GUI to check out these logs at your leisure. And when necessary, you can go in and adjust log levels to debug these issues. To get to the GUI, simply visit the Manage Jenkins icon in the app and click on System Log. Once inside the system log, you're going to notice that you're taken to the All Logs view and that actions performed by the application are logged here in a human readable format. Most notably, the timestamp is provided, which is reported by the date and time set on the host operating system that Jenkins is running on. So let's take a look at the log I've highlighted in red. There's several different pieces of information I can gather by looking at this log output. Firstly, the date and time are printed, so I know when the action took place. The log level is also here, and there are several different log levels that we're going to get into in the next slide. But this particular one is an info log level. The Java package name is listed here, so we would know where to look in the code repositories for additional information if we needed to. The class within that package is named here, so we know which class is being invoked. And lastly, the method being called from within that class. Regarding log levels, the most commonly used ones are listed in the slide, with finest being the most verbose and fatal being the least verbose. In addition to what's listed here, we also sometimes see debug. But Jenkins, as well as most plugins, don't use debug unless it's a custom version for debugging purposes only. Going back to the system log menu options within the Jenkins UI, you'll notice that you can select logger list from the menu. This is a list of all the custom loggers that are currently deployed on your system, in addition to the all Jenkins logs option. We'll show you how to create these custom loggers in just a minute. So what's missing from the UI? Well, since Jenkins offers this awesome UI at my fingertips as an administrator, why would I ever go into this, to the command line to chase down logs? Well, being able to navigate into the file system and track down Jenkins logs is a powerful tool. Reason being is that the UI is limited in several ways. First, it doesn't tail. The search capability is limited to what your browser can handle. You can't send this log out to an aggregator like Splunk. You've got a limited history displayed in these logs, and you can't use a powerful tool like grep to help with your searches. Here's an example of some log output provided by the support core plugin. As you can see, the logs are rolling over nicely into a manageable format. And in this case, as an administrator, I need to understand how many times I've restarted the service over the last 48 hours. So here I have the ability to do a quick grep search that would search for a keyword in the Jenkins startup log, which is Jenkins is fully up and running. And I, you can see I get an immediate output showing me that the service has been started six times in the last 48 hours. If only I knew how to enable some custom logging to track down this issue I've been having, I wouldn't be restarting all the time. Well, that's where we can enable custom loggers. So going back into the system log menu, you'll see you have the ability to add a new log recorder here. You'll be presented with additional forms here once you press add new log recorder, where you can give your new log a custom name. You want to make sure that this log name makes sense. It does you no good to name this Ryan's log if I'm debugging an issue. If the issue I'm trying to debug involves the Chuck Norris plugin, then maybe I would want to call it the Chuck Norris log. You'll also be asked to add the relevant class log here and define that log level. Once you click save, this log is live and it's logging the data you've requested anytime that class gets used. Here's a real log I was working with from the Jenkins system log last week. Sam having some trouble with the Docker plugin and I want to dive in and see exactly what this plugin is doing step by step. In order to do that, I want to start typing in the package name into the logger field. Notice that that field will auto-complete for you on packages the system knows about. This makes it incredibly simple to create a custom logger. So let's say you're dealing with a third-party plugin, and what if it isn't giving me any logging? How would I know what package to log? Well, most Jenkins plugins have documentation inside their Git repository, which can guide you on what log levels you need to turn up. For instance, let's say I'm having an issue with the SAML plugin. I'd visit the plugin page first, located at plugins.jenkins.io. From there, I follow that GitHub link or other SCM link to the repository, 
And once inside the repo, I'd first look for a readme file. I'd then explore that readme file. And as you can see here, we find some log level documentation right away, which we could then go back and add to the Jenkins UI and I can debug my issue. So what happens if there is no readme file? Well, if there is no documentation, the package can usually be located within the repository after the source main Java folder. And as you can see here, in this case it is, and it matches exactly what was in the troubleshooting guide. One other great feature of custom logging is that you can log multiple classes within the same log. You can see in this example, I'm trying to track down just about every class that interacts or might interact with the Git plugin. Even if you have duplicative entries here, the class output's still going to be logged to this custom logger that you define. Now you've seen how powerful the custom logging feature is for Jenkins and how it can assist you in adding verbosity. Let's re recap some of our best practices we've covered. Creating a common sense logger name is key. Removing custom loggers you've created when you're done debugging is also a great best practice. I mention this because I can't begin to tell you how many times I've seen log verbosity be at the root cause of a performance issue, all because someone forgot to remove their custom logger. It's important to understand that logging has overhead to IO throughput. These logs can spit out a huge amount of data in a short time, and you can absolutely bring the system to a crawl. So best to keep your debugging on the development system and leave production alone. Next up, I want to cover how to read and understand a Java stack trace. What I'm showing you here is a dummy mockup of how a stack trace is built. When you see things go wrong in a Java application, a pattern similar to the one I'm showing you here will emerge. This whole mess of text is called a stack trace. It essentially contains three important things, the exception type, the message, and a list of all the method calls which were in progress when the exception occurred. To break this down, let's take a look at the stack trace line by line. Here we can see three important segments of the first line of the stack trace. First, you see the thread name where the exception is thrown. This is really nice to have because you can search the Jenkins logs for additional information on this. Second, we see the type of exception that was thrown. This is really good information to have because most of the time there are corresponding Java docs that you can search through online. And they'll typically have more information about these exceptions. Lastly, we're left with the message. And essentially, this is provided by the developer to point you in hopefully a good direction to resolution. So let's look at line two of this stack trace. This tells where the exception was thrown. From this line, we can gather that the method that was responsible for throwing the exception, and we can get the file name and line number so we can trace this back within the code base. This is powerful. It can assist you as a Jenkins admin to engage with your developers and know exactly where the problem is. Imagine the time that can save you. But let's go even further down the rabbit hole because I, I wanna know what part of the code called this bad method. Well, you can gather that data in the next line of the stack trace and so on, and so on, and so on. That's the secret sauce here. And something that a lot of admins don't understand is that the stack trace actually reports every piece of code that was touched from bottom up. So for those of you who aren't familiar in this area, a stack trace can be enormous because it can go all the way back to the main method of the application where the whole thing started. So let's take a look at a real Jenkins stack trace here and walk through a few things. What are some things I can gather here based on what we've learned so far? Well, first, I can see the date and time that the stack trace was thrown. Then, I can see this as a warning log level, which, as we know, can potentially be an undesirable situation. Now, as a Jenkins administrator, I, I know that Groovy CPS is used for pipelines, so it's safe to assume this has something to do with a pipeline. This sure looks like a build job name and build number to me. Here's my message provided by the stack trace telling me that this script is not permitted to use this method. Wait, this is coming from the script security plugin and it's throwing a rejected access exception. I bet if I go and check the script security console, I have a new method to approve from one of my developers. Sure enough, I've got 14 pending approvals. So diagnosing that stack trace took me all of 30 seconds and it was able to lead me to the issue 
directly in the script approval UI. Once I approved the script, the build was successful. This is the inherent value in learning these diagnosis techniques because it really saves you the most precious commodity in your software development cycle, which is time to issue resolution. I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Alex, who's gonna walk us through a couple of real world data examples and describe to you how he was able to determine root cause analysis by employing the knowledge we're sharing with you here today. Alex? Thanks, Ryan. Um, so the first real world example that we're taking a look at is gonna be the JIRA plugin. Um, so what happened was you, um, you, you have a situation where um, the uh, JIRA hook is not working. And um, when you have uh, a, a, a JIRA hook that's not working, we didn't understand why it wasn't working. Essentially, what's supposed to happen there is you update a JIRA issue, it all of a sudden triggers a build, and then that's useful, in from, uh, it, that's useful for running something on the particular build based upon the, the JIRA issue change. So what we, basically what we had to look at is, um, how do you start when trying to figure out what's happening here? Is, is that you've got this communication breakdown, you've got this situation where JIRA appears to be working, Jenkins appears to be working, but nothing is actually communicating between the two. And then also, how do you address this issue coming from an external plugin? Is that this isn't Jenkins core, like you had to install a plugin in order for it to be able to trigger a change on the actual JIRA issue, which in turn uh, triggered the actual job. So how do you go and find this communication breakdown? And then how do you go and address where to be able to track down this issue inside of the plugin that this is being caused by? So obviously this is an open source community plugin. Um, there's an open source community uh, JIRA tracker for, hey, I'm having this particular issue. You submit an issue to that particular tracker. Um, you have either the maintainer um, be able to fix it, or you can even go in and change the code yourself to be able to fix stuff. Sorry, yet. Um, so um, what we were provided at, uh, inside of Jenkins support was, hey, I have this JIRA issue that's supposed to go and trigger a, a change, and it's supposed to build a job, and it's just not working. Um, from the JIRA side, it says, hey, I'm getting a 403, um, and, and I don't really understand why. And the data that we were given um, was the logs from the JIRA side, and we were given a support bundle from the master itself where, uh, where the triggering was not actually happening. So what do we know here? A, it's inside of an open source plugin. B, there's some sort of communication breakdown between JIRA and this Jenkins. Um, and then C, all we know is we've got a response code of 403. So if we could go to the next slide. Um, what we were able to do is inside of the support bundle, we were able to see all of the previous logs from the last few days um, on this particular master. So during um, our, we basically did a grep search over those logs and we were able to find, we were looking for anything that had to do with JIRA. And so we basically did a grep for JIRA and we ended up finding this particular error message. In this particular error message, we know there was an error while serving the endpoint of their particular JIRA um, and it was the JSON object it was looking for a particular value on that JSON object and it just wasn't found. And so we can clearly see that um, the JIRA trigger plugin is causing this particular, um, uh, this particular error message. And we know that some sort of name object is not found. So um, the, basically what we need to find out is what does that JSON object look like? Is it not parsing it correctly? Is it, doesn't not actually exist? Is it not getting the full JSON object? Um, it could be any number of those things. Um, and then does this mean that there's some sort of configuration issue that we have on the master of Jenkins, like, hey, you shouldn't be parsing for that, or something on the JIRA side where it says, hey, we need to be sending this particular style of JSON object so that the actual plugin can work. So we could go on to the next slide as well. So what we did was we enabled a custom logger that was specifically for the JIRA trigger. And the logger that we um, were 
trying to be able to find was the plugins, Jira trigger, and webhook. And so this is going to capture any um, class that is downstream of the webhook folder. And it's going to hopefully enable us to be able to see what the actual JSON object looked like. And so obviously this JSON object is enormous. Um, I, um, slides aren't big enough to be able to include it, but this is the beginning of a very fine logger that's not going to be consistently shown inside of the standard Jenkins logs, where you can see the exact JSON object from being sent by JIRA. And so we know we're getting a full and not truncated JSON object. We know that um, it's including specific data that we need, but upon searching in that JSON object, the top level name object doesn't actually exist. And so we know for sure that the JSON object just doesn't physically contain the information that the plugin needs in order to be able to parse. So, um, sorry, if we could go actually back a slide, that would be great. So inside of this particular stack trace, what we know is the, the, we've got the JIRA trigger plugin, and we know the JSON object name is not found. So we're going to have to actually look over the stack trace to be able to figure out where it's coming from. So remember in your mind what this stack trace looks like. I believe we bring it up again, but so let's go ahead to uh, two ahead, Ryan, if we could. Uh, so our first thing is we're going to look for known issues inside of the community open source JIRA tracker. Um, on searching there, we didn't find anything very specific. Um, there was no issue that was reported against the JIRA trigger plugin that contained this exact error message. So we started looking inside of the CloudBees knowledge base. We don't have a knowledge base for this yet. So then what we did was we started looking for um, this name object inside of JSON for, from JIRA. And so we started looking through Atlassian um, documentation. And what we ended up finding was there was a huge change to the REST API from JIRA Cloud, where they actually deprecated, uh, and if we can go on to the next one, uh, they deprecated the name field inside of the JSON object. So something is wrong inside of the plugin where it says, I need to be able to parse for this name because that name object is never going to come across because it's been deprecated by JIRA. So that sounds like exactly the issue that we're experiencing. How do we go about finding out the fix for it? So let's go on to the next slide. What I want to point out here is inside of this stack trace, <clears throat> we have org code house, and then we have a um, uh, getting a JSON object. Org code house is a, a totally separate JSON parsing library. Most likely, that's not going to be our issue. Then we've got, we, we go down two lines, we've got com Atlassian Jira REST client. So that's going to be Atlassian's proprietary REST client um, parsing capability. That So again, nothing to do specifically with Jenkins. So let's find the first line that we have for Jenkins specific. And we've got this com seal force Jenkins plugins Jira trigger. So this is the plugin that we're looking at from Jenkins. What we want to do is we want to parse all the way down to the end of this, find out what method it's calling and where it's calling that method, which is this webhook comment event JSON parser dot groovy. So uh, next slide. This is actually the very line in the code where this is being executed. So what's happening here is this new comment JSON parser, this comment JSON parser is um, the JIRA REST client. So it's creating a new JIRA REST client and it's saying, hey, parse this webhook event with this uh, um, JSON object. And so the problem here is we don't really have the capability to fix this inside of our particular, inside of this open source plugin. There's nothing that we can do here to say, hey, stop using the name field because all that we're doing is, is we're saying, hey, JIRA REST client, parse this event. So what we had to start looking at is in the next slide, um, I, I, we moved up a line. Actually, yeah, sorry, we can go back to the stack trace. 
uh, we moved up a line and we say, okay, so this com at Lassie and Jira REST client, that's probably where we need to be looking. And so what we're going to look is we're going to look at this comment JSON parser um, and this JSON parse util to be able to parse this basic user. And so if we could go to that code, because luckily um, the uh, Jira is willing to make this public and open source, we were able to actually physically find the command that was being called. And you can see here it's saying json.getString and the name. But that has been completely deprecated, so it should not be doing this call. So at that point, what we did was we had to make a con we had to make contact with Jira and say, "Hey, you guys' default REST client is looking for an object that you have specifically deprecated. What should we do about this? Is this something where we need to be changing what we're like what command that we're using? Is this something that you guys need to be fixing internally?" Um, and, and from there, we, we were able to figure out a, a fix potentially to this issue, which ended up being um, to just use a different parse method. So the second real world example is one that is incredibly common um, where agents won't specifically connect. So what you have a, is a situation where um, you have a agent that is usually controlled by another team and you're trying to connect it back to Jenkins and it's just not doing it. And so we don't necessarily understand why that's actually happening. So where do you start? What do you do in terms of being able to find this particular issue? So do you immediately start at networking? Do you start at ports, firewalls, proxy servers, misconfiguration? Really, the very first place to look at is I want to see the exact stack trace of the failure inside of the logs. And so what we do is we pull the logs from both the master and from the agent. And in this particular situation, um, the agent logs are the ones that's providing us the very first error. So um, what's happening is um, when we are physically launching the command of um, the Java jar JNLP um, agent, this is on the command line of a particular Windows agent. And what it's giving us is it's saying, I'm trying to connect back to the master and I'm failing because the server certificates don't match. So you've got an HTTPS master, as we can see by HTTPS colon slash slash Jenkins, mybusiness.com. And what it's saying is, is the certificates that are on the agent don't match the certificates on the master. So we can, we can do one of two things. We can either throw this no certificate check option so that essentially we're saying, yes, I know this endpoint is HTTPS. We're just going to ignore that for right now or we have to install the certificates on the Java um, CA certs of the actual agent itself so that it, will, um, it won't fail the certificate check anymore. Um, and so what we did was we, we grabbed this information through a support bundle. Um, we had the actual agent logs and then we had them check via HTTP, HTTPS, and um, see if there are any known issues to be able to resolve this particular, uh, this particular issue. So uh, if we could go to the next slide. Um, what we ended up finding was there was actually a, uh, a um, Java version that is not a normal Java version. Um, you've got this Azul Systems uh, Inc. Java version that's, uh, that these people, that this particular user was was using. And we were able to reveal that first. What we did was we resolved the certificates error and then it started throwing an additional error and it was being caused by this difference in Java on the agent and Java on the master. And so what we had was we were able to discover this by manually launching the command on the agent, see the resulting logs on the master side, and saw that what we were getting is inside of the next slide, this particular error. 
So we, uh, again, we moved past the certificates error, but we were getting now a 401 unauthorized error. And so what was happening is this, this jar, Java jar command was trying to connect back to the master. And what it was getting back from the master was you're not authorized to pull this particular slave agent JNLP jar. Um, and in, the, in this process, we discovered that it was because of the um, unusual Java version that they were using for their master. We were able to end up resolving this by just switching them to the open JDK version on the master. So, but the one problem here is this 401 unauthorized is not a super obvious error. So we know that communication is happening. It's able to hit that endpoint. It's just getting a, you're not authorized to be able to access this endpoint. So what we ended up having to do was we um, found the exact error message where the link up was not happening by asking their particular network team. Um, yeah, sorry, uh, next, I, I, I kind of talked through that one. So, um, and through their network team, what we needed to ask was, is there a firewall in between this? Is there a proxy in between this? Or does this user just not have permission to be able to access it? And so what we had to do is we had to get the networking team onto the phone so that way we could see like, well, this request happens normally using HTTP. Um, this request happens to another server just fine. So it has to be something specific to the master. And, and like I said, the, the end result was to be able to correct the Java version that was in use on the master. Awesome. I think that's it. Yeah. Alex, thanks so much for that. I, I think some, some key takeaways there is that um, the issue never, or, or a lot of times the issue doesn't present, present itself straightforwardly, right? So a, a lot of these root cause analysis that, that you just walked us through are layered and, and, um, and debugging can be a process, you know, and, and the best way to, to get to the root cause is by looking at those logs. And that's what we talked about today. Uh, th thanks for that presentation, Alex. So I, I'd like to talk to you all about Cloud B support for just a few minutes. Um, as a member of the support team, um, I, I've got a lot of love for this organization. It's a great, great group of, of folks that I work with. Um, if you're here today, chances are high that Jenkins is a critical piece of your infrastructure, and it plays a super important role in your software delivery life, uh, your software delivery cycle. With that, you know that performance is key uh, in this whole thing, and a support and maintenance subscription from CloudBees can enable you to be as successful as possible with Jenkins. And, and we really keep the moving pieces of your CI CD pipeline conti uh, continuing to move efficiently. It's a big Jenkins world out there. And becoming an expert in all things Jenkins usually takes years of experience to culminate that knowledge. Our engineers have that knowledge. We have the largest group of certified Jenkins engineers in the world. Our support knowledge base contains a library of information ready to help you solve whatever issue you might be facing. So you don't have to turn to Google or Stack Overflow or other shaky areas to get answers to your questions or deal with the complexities of Jenkins like plugin management, pipeline best practices and updates. Our support team is here to help you. A support and maintenance subscription from CloudBees enables you to be successful. And that's really the key I wanna drive home with you today. And that, that's not just our CloudBees Enterprise product line. We also support Jenkins LTS and CloudBees Jenkins distribution as well. One of the best parts of our support offering is our follow the sun support hours. A lot of people don't know this, but our teams reside all over the world from Vancouver to Denver, Colorado, to Raleigh, to Spain, all the way to Australia. And you get the benefit of having a named customer success manager who's there with you every step of the way with your Jenkins journey. As a CloudBees customer, you get access to a huge library of online trainings around popular topics like administration, pipeline basics, advanced pipeline training, or maybe you just want to get your Jenkins certification. If that's something you're interested in, the classes we offer through our training portal are incredibly well done, and, and I, would, I would highly recommend that you check them out. Some of the best feedback we've received from our support offering has been around the assisted update program. If you've been through a Jenkins update in the past, 
you know it can cause anxiety with plug-in dependencies, making sure backups are in place, verifying build jobs work after the update, even syntax changes. With our assisted update program, the Cloud V support team works with you proactively to create a plan together that makes your update run as smooth as possible. And if you're a Platinum subscriber, we offer live assistance during your scheduled update. If you've seen the TurboTax commercials here in the United States, everybody loves free, 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 free. And if you haven't heard about Jenkins Health Advisor yet, it's free. I strongly recommend that you check this out after the webinar. Go and download and install this plugin. Our support team is focused around automation and making your life easier. And as part of that, we wanted to share Advisor with you. Advisor automatically analyzes your Jenkins environment and provides you proactive reporting to you on potential issues before they get out of hand. It also emails you with solutions to discovered issues so that it can prioritize accordingly. This is sure to be the plugin of the year for 2020. Now, some of you may be longtime Jenkins LTS users, and that's cool, but I want to bring your attention to CloudBee's Jenkins distribution. CJD is free, 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 and it always will be. It's a highly dependable distribution with stability, security, and a, ver a verified update pass right out of the box. It's built from the most recent Jenkins LTS, so migrating over from OSS is a breeze. CJD gives you out-of-the-box support to know which plugins are compatible and secure, which ones are tested and verified by CloudBees, you can automatically manage plugins and updates with the built-in beekeeper assistant, and you can proactively identify issues because CloudBees Health Advisor comes installed by default. I hope you'll take us up on exploring the free CJD offering, but if you choose to run Jenkins LTS, I'd advise to make sure you install not only CloudBees Health Advisor, but also the support core plugin. This plugin provides the basic infrastructure for generating bundles of support information within Jenkins so you can track down logs easily and in one place. There's essentially three ways this plugin generates bundles. It, autom it does automatic bundle generation, and these get saved within Jenkins home slash support about once per hour. You can, you can uh, create a bundle on demand using the user, user interface or you can use the command line, which can easily be integrated to scripts you might already have laying around to gather other data, right? And as you can see by this long list of information that the CloudBee support bundle can gather, it's a one-stop shop for collecting logs from all your agents, all your masters, what your build queue looks like, um, what the load statistics are. There, there's a variety of information on this can gather. And, and, uh, and working with our support team, we can proactively identify these issues. Um, I want to introduce you to our newest tool that's being offered to you for free from our support tooling team, and it's called CB Support. This is a new interactive command line tool that makes gathering data incredibly easy in your environment, especially if you're using Kubernetes with Jenkins. It requires minimal setup. It has extensive documentation, and it really aims to make your life easier by being a single point of monitoring for your cluster. Some of examples of how we're using the CB support today include some of these options I've shown you here. But as a real world example, let's say that as a Jenkins administrator, one of my developers has reported a build failure to me and is asking how to fix it. Well, all I, all I have to know is which master, which job, and what build number is experiencing the issue. I can run CB support, required data build, and I'm essentially met with an interactive command line that allows me to fill in that data, and the tool gathers all the logs and data I would need to diagnose that issue. It saves me an incredible amount of time so I can get back to building cool stuff. Some of the coolest new features of CB support include data gathering for Kubernetes ingress issues, which seems to be a huge pain point for a lot of Kubernetes administrators. And having the ability to do that one-stop shopping for data is invaluable. As a sneak preview, whether you're a CloudBees customer or not, coming very soon, we're adding functionality to the CB support CLI to upload the data that you've gathered 
directly to our support team. And this means you'll never have to leave the command line to report an issue. Really, really cool stuff. So if you're ready to jump on board, please feel free to shoot us an email um, over to Max. Uh, his email is mrbuckle at cloudbees.com. We would love to hear from you and we'd love to get the conversation started. At this point, we're gonna take Q&A. All right, thanks Ryan and Alex. Uh, great presentation and we do have some questions to go over. So uh, let's, let's look at this first one. There's the following example. Hudson.plugins.myplugin include Hudson.plugins.myplugin.class when creating a logger? So that answer is yes. Um, so one of the things that uh, the, this is when you're creating a custom logger inside of the UI um, is you can be as specific or as not specific as you would like inside of a particular plugin. So the plugin, if you even if you choose the root level of the plugin, it's going to grab logs from everything north or, or everything um, downstream of that. So yes, absolutely, uh, leaving off the class will also capture the the additional class logs. Um, yeah, sorry, Max. I, I can read out this next one uh, okay. and answer it as well. So um, when you're looking at the uh, the thread. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the stack trace inside of the logs, there was an, uh, a bracket ID equal to and then a series of numbers or letters or what have you. Um, that's actually the thread ID of the log message. So whichever thread through the log message, that's its thread ID. Um, and so it just, for me personally, I haven't actually found that uh, to be advantageous in, in diagnosing issues. But if you had a particular troublesome thread um, and, and you wanted to see what it was doing over time, that would be a good way to be able to track it down. Um, so then the next one that I'm seeing is, uh, does support core plugin store logs from loggers defined via the UI on the file system? Yes, uh, the support core plugin will create a new folder that's called logs. And inside of that, it will create a auto rotating file for each custom logger that you have. Um, and that gets bundled up not only in the support bundle, but also so you can look at it directly. Um, so there was a question that was, will there be any talks about CloudBees core? Um, I, Max, that might be something you'd be better answering. We, we will have plenty coming up, yes. Okay. Um, the last one inside of the chat that I'm seeing is how do you store thousands of job build logs for 90 days at least? We are deleting builds regularly and keeping only 10 days. So if you're talking about doing something like that, if you build logs can be way bigger than the Jenkins logs, just because you have a lot of jobs potentially inside of the Jenkins instance. For something like this, what I would do is continue saying, delete the builds every 10 days, but regularly um, store the logs in zipped up format, um, like the whole build folders probably, in some sort of external location, like an NFS. And I would have something like a job that just periodically goes through and, and, and does that storage. Um, really, that, that would be for stuff like auditing purposes. And so you just, you don't want it inside of the Jenkins home because then your Jenkins home is gonna be entirely too enormous. Um, I would try and keep it off Jenkins home and only have it happen every once in a while. Something like timed with your backup uh, because most people do a backup every day. Um, inside of that backup process, you could go and archive those particular builds, or you could rely on just the backups to store the, the existing logs, if that would work for you as well. Um, last one inside of the chat is, is there a minimum version of uh, Jenkins that you need in order to install Health Advisor? There is. Um, hang on, let me, let me look at it. Uh, I don't, sorry, I don't know that one off the top of my head. Uh, so I'm going to go look at, yeah. 
no, nope, that's not helpful. Sorry, I was looking for the uh, plugin wiki page because that's where it should be. It, yeah, if you ever have questions about what's the minimum supported version, um, the the plugin site is the best place to go because it says right underneath the name the minimum Jenkins requirement. And so right now the minimum Jenkins requirement is two one thirty eight four. Yeah, the wiki page goes slow. Um, and and Sudhir, sorry, I, I was just about to get to yours. Uh, sorry, uh, Ryan, if you'll go up and just go to the actual plugin site rather than the wiki page. Oh, that's the support core, not uh, health advisor here. Um, I'm going to put it inside of the chat so that way everybody has it. Um, how can I make sure to not log all of the pipeline messages and only log custom messages or route the pipelines messages to a custom log file? So uh, Sudhir, this type of thing is actually not related to the Jenkins logs that we were talking about. This is something where each individual build on a pipeline gets its own pipeline log file. Um, right now, I don't know of a way to only log certain custom messages because what it would require is you to essentially overwrite the default logging location for the pipeline plugins. Is that by, by default, um, the pipeline plugins say, hey, log this to the current console out. And, uh, and you would have to somehow overwrite where that actual location is. And I'm not aware of a default way for that to happen. Um, in general, I don't, so there is a plugin that allows you to compress those log files, um, which that may work for you better. Um, but I, I guess it, it, these logs shouldn't be too long. Is that if you're talking about multiple, like hundreds of meg files, um, I think that you might want to think about breaking up that pipeline into smaller pieces. Um, how do I get a support core bundle when I don't have SSH access to my company's G uh, Jenkins master? Um, there's a UI button to be able to do it and it downloads it directly through your browser. So um, if you go direct to uh, is it essentially, it's on the left-hand side, it's support, and then, um, yeah, yeah, exactly. And then down below where you where the screenshot can see, uh, there's a generate bundle and it'll download it directly into the browser without you needing SSH access. Um, how can I use my Jenkins logs to troubleshoot my instance if my logs are full of a specific log in a loop that make it impossible to track the rest of the logs? This is a great question uh, because it's something that we struggle with here at, at CloudBees constantly. Um, A, finding that specific log that keeps getting thrown and stopping it from happening. Um, most of the time it's like warnings that consistently loop over themselves. So like for example, one of the biggest ones that we have is um, you have an agent that is offline and the master keeps trying to bring it online and it tries to bring it on about every second, if not multiple times a second. And what you'll see is these constant trying to connect to this agent can't because of this error message, trying to connect to this agent can't because of this error message. In that particular situation, what we would say is delete that agent if it's not going to come online. Um, in, in another particular circumstance, which you can actually do is, enable a custom logger, even if it's the same exact messages that come across inside of the Jenkins logs, dump it into a custom logger that is specifically catered to the stuff that you genuinely care about. And then you can leave it at whatever level of um, verbosity that you actually want. Like for example, I'm looking for a warning inside of the Jira plugin and it, I can't find it because there are thousands of other logs that constantly fill everything up just go and create a custom logger for the Jira plugin and only have that class inside of that custom logger and you can see the error message.
Uh, I just uh, I had another one come in just now, Alex. Uh, sure. I think a pretty simple one. Will Jenkins this these Jenkins support offerings be good on the OSS or just enterprise? Um, I can answer that, Max. So Jenkins support uh, does support Jenkins LTS, um, and and we also pro provide support for CloudViews Jenkins distribution as well. So it's not just for our enterprise offerings. And if that's something that you want to explore, feel free to email Max directly. All right, let's maybe give it just a minute, see if any other questions come in. Uh, in case they don't, in the meantime, Ryan, Alex, do you have any uh, parting words that you want to leave us with? Thanks for attending. I really appreciate you guys being here. Yeah, um, I just want to say thank you to Alex uh, for his for his contribution here and um, and answering all his awesome technical questions that we've got. Um, hopefully, the goal of this is, is that y'all walked away with some new tools that you can put in your tool belt and hopefully reduce the time to resolution when when you're getting these questions from your your Jenkins end user. Um, ultimately, if you're able to self service and understand these these logs yourself, it's going to drive uh, drive your time to resolution time down, and that's going to make everybody happy, happy, happy. So, um, thank you all so much for having us, and enjoy the rest of your day. All right, uh, not seeing more questions, so I think that's going to be it for today. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you for asking the great questions you did. And just a quick reminder, a survey link is about to pop up, just asking what you thought and we'd like to learn more about. My email, mrbuckle at cloudbees.com, is in the chat for if anyone wants to get hold of us after the fact. And the recording and slides will be available very soon. So thanks again. We look forward to hear, talking to you again real soon. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.